Festival with the uh, folks at the Riverbend Mall House. This is uh, Brent Manning and Brian Simpson, and they're going to show us around the Riverbend Mall House. So let's go see what they got to show us. So Brent, tell us about what we do here at Riverbend Mall House. Well, Riverbend Mall House was started as a uh, triple bottom line company focusing on making truly local beer. And by truly local, we mean connecting our existing brewery network in North Carolina to grain that's actually grown in North Carolina. Most folks, when they hear a local beer, assume that all the ingredients come from near the brewery, but that's definitely not the case. Um, what we're talking about is, you know, the beer industry is sourced, sourcing barley from Western US, Western Canada, and Western Europe. So North Carolina's farmers are essentially unable to take advantage of the explosive growth that this industry is, is undertaking right now. And by opening a malt house, we serve as that crucial middleman in between the farmer and the brew house. And uh, the malting process is fairly simple, but definitely labor intensive. And we take an artisanal approach to producing this product and things that really turned out well for us in our first year of operation. That's great. So Brian, you want to show us um, what the process is? Yeah, so there's a three-step process to malting. And the first step in the malt process is steeping, the second step is germination, and the third step is kilning. So what we utilize is a traditional uh, floor malt method of germination which is similar to the way they have done in uh, England and Scotland for several hundred years. And it seems to really work well with the barley that we can grow in North Carolina, produce a really uh, rich aroma, and also get the most out of the grain that's grown here. So we start off with the steeping process. It usually takes about 40 hours. So what we're trying to do is take the grain from the field and then go to um, from 11 or 12 percent moisture content slowly up to about 42 to 45 percent moisture content. And you're putting what grain in here? What state is the grain in when it goes into steep tank? Right. So this is raw barley, wheat, or rye. Okay. Um, we generally use about the same methodology. We change up the percentage of water intake and the um, air time versus time underwater um, based on what the what grain type it is. So. Right now we have a, a rye in here, but generally for barley, which is mo a majority of the product that we do, is um, takes about 40 hours start to finish on the steeping. And that would be six to eight hours underwater with a 12 hour dry period, and then another like seven hours underwater with a 12 hour dry period. And then the third day we would do about a two hour steep process and it should be at about 43, 44% moisture content. And from the steeping process, from the steep process, we move over to the germination floor. So now, what's the actual physical movement like? We you, actually lift up these steep tanks with a forklift. Okay. And then we open up butterfly valves that are on the bottom. All right. And then we drop the grain on the floor. We spread it out to a nice even depth. And we use a rake that we did, we uh, had made from an artisan over in West Africa. Now, you referenced this as artisan. It, to me, it looks like what I would call like old school, traditional. It is. It's a traditional it's, method of actually uh, germinating the grain. So what we're trying to do is we've created respiration inside the grain. We're trying to create enzymes in the grain, which in the field would actually be uh, you're growing the grain is starting to grow. So it's germinating just as it would if it was growing in a field. So. In order to do that, it has to create fuel inside the grain. So it's breaking down cell wall and creating the enzymes that actually later be sugar in the mash. And you're raking it to keep it aerated and not molded. Keep air into it. Air into it. And get heat out and also other gases out. Carbon dioxide and some in other some gases. Sense. It actually generates a lot of heat. So if we didn't rake this grain, it would actually just generate a lot of heat. It would sweat. And we also, we want to keep humidity high and the temperature about 66 degrees here. I noticed, this here. I noticed uh, we, you said this before, but we want to stay on the camera too. Yeah. This temperature, ambient temperature is here like, what, 65? 60, we keep it at 65, 66 degrees year round and the moisture content above 70 uh, humidity at all times. So it goes on the floor and, and it's tended to, how often do you rake? We rake every uh, six to eight hours. For how long? Three to five days. Right now it's three days. This barley seems to germinate really well and be fully modified after about 
three units. Now, is this just another pile in the same exactly. process? So each, the these, process. each pile represents one tank. Okay. All right. Um, it's about 800 to 900 pounds in each stack right now. All right. And this grain goes on the floor, like I said, at about 44% uh, moisture content. And then after two or three days, it's still on, it's still at about 42% moisture content. We're also checking the growth of the barley. Uh, we're looking at the acrospear inside the grain. So you can see the rootlet growth you want to keep very short. And what we're trying to do is develop the interior of the grain, you know. So we want the rootlet short. That's why we keep the temperature low. And then we keep the acrosphere long on the inside. So we're waiting on the acrosphere, which is the first leaf, basically, to grow mm -hmm. um, in the grain. We want it to be about 95% of the length of the grain by the time it's finished uh, germinating. And that would indicate that it's fully modified. So you can see this one is about at... 50, 60 percent length of the grain. So we still have about 12, 18 hours to go in the germination process. All right. After and that, we will. Uh, we're going to go to the next step in just a minute. Yeah. Uh, so this is three to five days. Three to five days. Right now, it's at three days. Yeah. Okay. Let's go next and see what happens after the three or five days. So now we have uh, brought the grain after three or five days. Over and we learned it's a manual process with a fancy wheelbarrow and shovel, and we've come to the kiln. And Brent's going to tell us about the kiln process and what's the next step in the process. So basically, what you see here is, is a stainless steel perforated bed that has an array of ductwork underneath it. So you've got a main trunk line and then six extensions that provide even flow for the warm air to penetrate through the grain bed. A full load for us is typically about a 12 to 15 inch deep bed here. That would be one of those circles piled with both, both piles. Right, so about coming into the kiln at about 16 to 1700 pounds wet, uh, or 40% moisture roughly. So basically we've got warm air coming up through the bed and exiting through the exhaust here. Mm -hmm. And we have a network of ducts that basically allow fresh air to come in and then the warm, moist air to be evacuated out of the building. And so the point is to dry? Absolutely. So the kilning process has three distinct stages. The first being what was referred to as free dry. And that's where a majority of the moisture is removed at a low temperature, but a high volume of air. So we're taking moisture down from roughly 40% at the beginning to 12% over the course of 16 to 18 hours with temperatures in the 120s. Um, so, as again, that handles the majority of that removal. From free dry, we then move into forced dry, wherein we elevate the temperatures about 20 to 30 degrees, keep the same air volume coming through there, and now we're taking moisture down from roughly 12 to about 7 to 8% moisture. So. The third and, and final stage of kilning is referred to as curing, where we take the temperatures up to in the 170s or low 180s, and that handles the removal of the final 2 to 3 percent of moisture, so that at the end of the process, we're left with grain that's roughly in the 4 to 5 percent moisture range. That works best for milling and is best for overall brew house efficiency as well. For every 1% of moisture that remains in that grain, you get a poor crush and you get lower efficiency in the brew house. So okay. it's really important to manage everything. That final color, that, that final heat uh, shot also helps give that sort of warm toasted bread aroma to and, the to And the, the more you toast and the more you heat, the different you flavor or? Well, a lot, the color can come in a lot of different forms and fashions. Uh, Munich malt, for example, is, is actually, you get more color development in the early stages and you've got, it's just a matter of uh, modulating your airflow at, and temperature as well. So for a Munich malt, you might turn down your fan volume so you've got less air but the same amount of heat coming through. And you're actually it, the browning a, reaction actually occurs right in the early stages of that, and then you develop the flavor profile at the end. So you've already done your color a little bit, and now you have your flavor coming through at the end. Right. So that that rich, bready mm -hmm. Munich flavor profile you may get from a darker colored malt sort of develops early in the process. You can't just plant at the end and be like, okay, we're going to take this dark now. 
doesn't It's just not a matter of that. cooking it longer or leaving it under, uh, under, under the toaster yeah, long. And that's kind of a misconception. It's not right. peanuts. Uh, right. You can't yeah. just keep cooking it until it gets to a point that it's where you want it color-wise. Yeah. You have to be very careful in the early stages. Because also in the end, you'll go past 2 or 3% or 4% moisture content, and then it makes milling. We, we lose a percent, you know, in the weight of the grain, and then plus milling becomes a little more complicated at that point. So after the kiln, we remove? We go over to the cleaning process. So it comes out of the kiln again, and we hand load it into a deep beater. So we want to remove the rootlets and any extra husk that's been cooked out of the grain. Uh, anything that would have an adverse flavor profile or add anything to the flavor of the grain that would, it would be unwanted. Because typically husk would give you an astringency that is not wanted in the grain. So we, we'll go we'll run it through the deep beater first to remove all that. You're basically polishing the grains with a set of um, beater bars. And you're calling this a deep beater? It's a deep yeah. beater. It actually takes the beard off of the grain. Um, these are all reconditioned machines we got from the Midwest. And then it, after it comes out of the deep beater, now we have both of those products. So we have the byproducts from the kilning process, which would be husk and uh, rootlet material or any farm material that it picked up during, you know, parts of the broom or whatever while we were sweeping. And then it goes into a seed cleaner, which actually separates the grain from the rootlet material itself. So any thins we have, you'll see there's a few thin um, grains in there. Right. And then there's also rootlet material and some husk. All that gets uh, comes off, and we use it as compost later on. Okay. The chicken farmers love it. So we separate uh -huh. everything out, and uh, then what we end up with is a very commercial, professional product. There, there's two different size screens for for this piece of equipment here. So basically, the top screen screens out any foreign material like a piece of broom straw or whatever and the next screen below it acts as a minimum size selector so that's why the thins fall out into the waste stream here and the finished product comes out of the main auger here. Everything goes out in 50 pound bags and we palletize it and ship it to local breweries. So um We've seen the process a little bit. We want to, I want to see it stacked over here. I want, to like, sure. I want everybody to see the name on the bag <laughs> and where it's going. And as you'll see, uh, viewers, we've got some stuff that looks like going to Weaver Radish, down on the coast, some stuff to full steam over in Durham. Feels good with maybe a question mark, so we won't go there. <laughs> they, they've got a sure. special pro project in, in the form of so the So it might be right going now. to Pisgah or not. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about the, what, as we close, the. Uh, the hopes and dreams for the river, for the, the malt house. Where are we going for River Band, and what do you think the future holds? And, and are you I'll, I'll let summer? Brent uh, speak a little bit to like uh, the philosophy behind what we're doing, okay. and uh, where we kind of see things heading in the future. So, yeah, you know, a, a big part of, of what we strive for it is a is a balance between creating a quality product and then also creating jobs in a sustainable fashion. We don't want to grow too fast. We want to grow to basically a point that allows us to, to service the North Carolina and South Carolina brewing and distilling markets. But we don't really have any aspirations of you know out outplacing Brees or uh, Gambrinus or anything like that. We just want to focus on connecting our brewers to our farmers here. You know they're. They've been, our, our farming community has been rocked by the pen, uh, peanut buyout, tobacco buyout, and you know, there's, there's just been a lot of stress on the family farm here, and this is just one way to create another niche market for our farmers to connect to an industry that's experiencing an absolutely amazing amount of growth in our area. It is uh, great to hear what you guys are doing. We appreciate it so much you hosting us here today. Uh, it's just fascinating to see what goes on and walking us through the process. Yeah. This has been another episode of the NC Beer Buzz. Uh, Dave's behind the camera this time, so I'll sign off. Uh, remember, drink local, keep your beer dollars in North Carolina. Until next time, we'll catch you later, Buzz.